All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from Patreon. Lots of gems, lots of fancy footwear, and lots of come over to the whiteboard and I'll show you how to rotate. Let's get to it. And every day I practice martial arts. <laughs> Yo, Mikey, how you doing, man? I'm doing great, Seagong. How are you? Good. I feel like we... We just did this. <laughs> oh, absolutely, definitely. Except, you know, no, we, we do it once a week, and, and I won't let anyone else believe that that's sure, the other way. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, we're not going to pierce the veil of how we do things here. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, yeah, I just feel like we've been cranking out so many of these because, uh, as we said multiple times, we're trying to get all these done before we go to Hong Kong. Perhaps by the time this episode comes out, we may be back from Hong yeah, Kong already. No, right. Uh, so uh, it was an awesome trip, wasn't it? Oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> yes. So uh, we have this uh, Ask Me Anything episode, which, as I mentioned in the last one, we're now going to be taking questions exclusively from our Patreon supporters. And we will still take uh, topic ideas from our YouTube uh, listeners and commenters. So for those of you in the YouTube world... Uh, we definitely still appreciate your comments. Let me know below what kind of things you want us to talk about. Single topic episodes, movies you want us to review. And mm -hmm. I know people really like the whole Bruce Lee versus Bruce Lee character thing. So I'm definitely down for doing more silly stuff like that. We talked last time about doing some ninja reviews and stuff. Maybe we're just going to turn into the martial arts version of like red letter media. Mm -hmm. Where it's just like you, me, and Dre sitting on a couch just like laughing at bad kung fu and martial art movies. And then, and then sitting in the studio and then reviewing them seriously after the fact. Oh yeah, sounds so good to me. That would be a lot of fun. Uh, and yeah, so that's the new format. So uh, this episode we will take a couple questions from our Patreon supporters. And uh, before we get started, speaking of Patreon, what would mm -hmm. you like that segue? Oh, very good. Nice. Uh, the best way to support The Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon, patreon.com slash The Kung Fu Genius. For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to episodes early. And for higher levels of support, you get all sorts of goodies. We even have like, uh, you can get a one-on-one -on -one private episode with The Kung Fu Genius not Absolutely. to be seen elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, I also have some things there like translations of Yip Man interviews from Chinese to English and my Instagram subscriber reels, which is like once a week on Instagram, I put a, a like a Wing Chun tip for my subscribers there. Well, I just give that to our Patreon guys so they don't have to uh, also subscribe to me on Instagram. So it's kind of a one-stop shop as far as that goes. And it's the same price, by the way. The uh, Instagram monthly uh, subscription for the lessons is $5. I'm not trying to nuke my Instagram subscription thing, but the base level of support on Patreon is $5. So it's, it's, it's the same thing. So if, you're, if you can only part with $5, uh, the best bang for your buck, I would say, is on uh, Patreon. So uh, there we go. So we have a couple Patreon questions. Yes, we do. So let's get to it. All right. First one coming up. Benjamin Dyson. As Kung Fu becomes less popular, many of us train with one or two partners and some online instruction. Do you have advice for the less formal solo or small club training crowd? Oh, that's a great question. By the way, Mikey, you are sweating like a whore in church. It's hot in here. I had the AC running before you came in. What did you do? Oh, um, all right. Okay. Well, wow. look, I mean, it can't be. It can't yeah. be. Uh, what's the yeah. word? We can't say it on the podcast. Yeah. You're, you, I'll, I'll say this: you're sweating like a former president at, at another indictment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say what my euphemism was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, just, I'm sure it was massively inappropriate. <laughs> Oh, yeah. It yes. Really is. As, I, as I may have mentioned on the podcast before, I've certainly mentioned this to you before. Um, you are you're a bit of a meme lord. So uh, for anyone who happens to be friends with you, connected to you through the mobile phone directly, uh, one could expect a almost daily deluge of <laughs> the most inappropriate stuff that is <laughs> so funny. But when you look at it, it makes you feel bad for laughing at it, and it makes you feel bad for looking at it. Mm -hmm. But you are the absolute meme lord. And, a Kate, and I remember one of our longtime supporters, and he's been on this podcast before, uh, uh, Topher, all right? Uh, that other Wing Chun guy, Sifu Topher. Every once in a while, you'll send me something. And then I'll send it to him, and he'll be like, "Yo, we have we have the same meme dealer, bro." <laughs> 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 like he had seen it already, right? And uh, I will occasionally be on Instagram. And Instagram, you know, when you go into like the 
kind of suggested posts or whatever. It, you know, it, it, it's really my algorithm for what Instagram shows me is very strange because obviously at the Kung Fu Genius on Instagram is a martial arts based Instagram channel. So it's like 70%, 70% of what shows up on my feed is martial arts related, but 30% is really oddball, disgusting, inappropriate <laughs> stuff. And I'll see something and I'll be like, oh my God. I have to send this. Oh, Mikey already liked it. <laughs> <laughs> it's always, always see that you've already liked it before I have a chance to send it. Hey, I don't have anything to do during the day, and I'm clearly never going to be like running for office. So, right, right. <laughs> you know. Yes. Uh, it's amazing, though. I want to one day see what your algorithm on your Instagram looks like. Uh, well, you already know at least one part of it. Yes, that's true. That's true. So on that sexy bombshell, uh, so we have now our question uh, from Benjamin Dyson about uh, basically, you know, uh, with having to train online, maybe with a lack of access to uh, professional Kung Fu schools or maybe starting a new group on your own, like kind of what are, I suppose, what are best practices for that? Well, I mean, um, before uh, the virus of unknown origins changed our lives for good, uh, if you had asked me, like, uh, can you teach Wing Chun online? I would have been like, uh, get out of here. What are you talking about? Of course you can't teach it online. Um, because, you know, we, we teach chi sao, we teach sparring, and you need to have an instructor there to actually go hands-on so you can feel. And, and I still feel that way. But when we um, were all afflicted with the virus of unknown origins and we were forced to stay home and we had to figure out a way to keep things moving, I uh, realized that uh, you actually can teach online to people who have already learned some Wing Chun, all right? Um, so, you know, teaching a brand new beginner from like kind of soup to nuts is probably impossible. But if you have a student base of people who are already training, uh, you can actually do something online to keep things going. It's not optimized. It's not ideal, but you can do something. Now, for instructors, people who are already teaching, online training is actually really great. I, did, I never thought about that before because the idea is like, well, if I can't stick hands with you, then what are we doing? But if I have an instructor who has an assistant and I see them online and they're training together, I can't necessarily feel exactly what's going on, but I can give them corrections. I can say, okay, look, your positions here are not exactly correct. You need to do this a little bit more. See if you can feel this. And so if I have two relatively qualified people, I can give them good corrections. And I started to do this with some of our partner schools in, uh, in the time since COVID. So I have a lesson with our Ohio guys once a week. Uh, whether it's uh, Andrew or uh, Sifu Jose. And like, it, I go through the program step by step with them because I got two guys there who can kind of go through it. And there's a lot you can do. And there's even some interactive stuff, almost like we did this during COVID where, you know, I stand in front of the camera and I lob punches and, and then you have a sea of people who have to kind of, you know, sidestep this way or move this way or do this. Mm -hmm. And then so th there are some things you can do in an interactive way to keep your reactions sharp, and to learn things like forms and basics and stuff. But obviously, to get any degree of competency in this art, you're gonna need someone who actually knows what they're doing who can actually teach it to you. But that doesn't mean that there's not tremendous value from uh, doing training online. So uh, the first thing is, well, obviously, if you have a qualified instructor who can teach you online, there is a lot you can get. But most of what you can get is going to be uh, by way of fundamentals, uh, footwork, punching, stepping, simultaneous movements, turning, things like that. And uh, even, you know, you could coach someone online on how to hit a wall bag, on how to hit a heavy bag, on, you know, how to move, how to defend certain things. And once they have this base, they can then get a partner or then go to a school and start training these things, right? So I, I still find that there's a tremendous amount of utility, even though there are limits to what you can do online. Uh, and that's easier if you have an instructor or if you have people who are already learning. Now for brand new students, I'm not entirely convinced uh, uh, that you can teach anything beyond maybe the first form and, and some steps and stuff like that because you can't teach someone from brand new and get them to chunk you level online. 
because one part of the Siunam Tau level is to do single arm Chi Sao. So we can do the single arm Chi Sao motions in the air. I can show you mechanically what it looks like, but I need to actually stick with you to feel it so that I know you're doing it correctly. I know you feel it and all that kind of stuff. And if, if I don't feel that, and if I haven't lobbed punches at you to see that you can send your hands forward, you can do timing one, timing two. As a beginner, you have that uh, proactive footwork. Well, I can't say, okay, well, I taught you the Siunam Tau online. Now I can teach you the Chum Q online. All right? mm -hmm. At some point, the student is going to have to come in and actually show that they can do what they learn. Because Wing Chun, unlike some other forms-based martial arts, is, is not just about, okay, you learn the Siunam Tau form and you look at it online. Okay, good enough. Now you can learn Chum Q. Um, because... We don't consider Siunam Tau level the, to be passed solely by the rote repetition of pantomiming a hand form in the air. Right. All right. That is only one small piece of it. We have to see, you know, how they move, how they react. Do they have some kind of understanding of how it works? It's not perfect at the end of Siunam Tau, but at least they have some idea of what to do and how to do it. And then we could say, okay, now we can start teaching you the second form and start going into double arm cheese out. So that is, that is the limitation with a brand new beginner is that um, I couldn't in all honesty, if that person wasn't training with someone else uh, who was qualified, teach someone the entire Siunam Tao curriculum and basic curriculum and go, okay, we're ready for Chum Q without there being some face-to-face uh, -face in between, mm -hmm. right? Meeting that person, right? So those are... Uh, those are the limitations. That's why most of my online training, which I offer, uh, we also have links for that below if you're an instructor. Even if you're not in the WT line, um, I've taught plenty of Wing Chun instructors and Wing Chun students from other lines who just want to go and get a different take or have some of their fundamentals corrected. By the way, uh, Benjamin Dyson, who asked this question on Patreon, has also taken an online lesson with me, and he's not a WT guy, right? right. He, uh, I, I gave him uh, a lesson about... Um, how to punch, how to hit the wall bag, how, you know, the basic punching theory in Wing Chun and how to improve his punch. So there are a lot of things I can do for people outside of our lineage who just want like some, to, you know, take a five lesson course where I kind of, we go over punching and kicking some basic stuff. It's not lineage specific stuff. It's right. just Kung Fu, right? Yeah. And then for people who are in my own lineage and if they're instructors, well, that's really super easy because I can help them create curriculum for their uh, for their own school to kind of organize the WT curriculum a little bit better. And I can, you know, obviously correct things like their wooden dummy forms and stuff like that. So if you happen to be in a position where you, you're kind of a beginner and you can only do online training, well, then you're going to have to at some point go to that instructor you're learning online from to actually get checked because if your instructor would just teach you and continue teaching you from the bottom to the top online having never touched hands with you then i i think that there's something a little fishy going on <laughs> it's it's another thing if the student came to me and okay i already learned siunam tau chum q buji and i've done chi sao and i've done wing chun for a number of years and now they kind of want to learn how i do things okay i'd be more amenable to that because at least i know they've done it but I'm not going to give that person a certificate, yeah. You know, or I'm not going to give put that you know the KFG stamp on that guy. But people can absolutely come and learn. If you have no choice but to learn online, I still would recommend at least once or twice a year you got to go and visit that person you're learning from. Otherwise, you really don't know. Wing Chun cannot just be transmitted uh, visually. Uh, so uh, now for the other question, which is like, okay, well, what if you're starting a little group? Well, that is actually a really good idea if you don't have access because you could learn a few lessons online and then the best way to get good at that stuff is to teach it to someone else, you know? And I know some people are like, uh, well, you can't really teach until you're a qualified instructor and that's totally true. You can't open a school. You can't claim to be an instructor if you're not in fact one. But if you're kind of a young, young in the style, I mean, uh, practitioner of the art, and you don't really have access to a qualified instructor, well, grabbing a training partner and going through the stuff you're learning with this other partner while, I'll, I'll use a British expression, whilst not perfect, <laughs> um, is still better than solely doing it on your own, right? Yeah. Because then you can at least, you know, teach it to someone else. And in that process of teaching, you are parroting and repeating what you learned online and thereby strengthening it. And then if you then went to your instructor, I think your abilities 
would be much better. We even notice the same thing here at City Wing Chun, and I, this is an observation I think most Wing Chun instructors would probably agree with me, um, that at City Wing Chun, you don't have to become an instructor. You can just learn Wing Chun. You can come and you can learn the, the beauty and dummy and weapons and everything like that. I don't have these weird requirements. Like if you don't open a school or you don't teach under me, I will never teach you the long pole or the bacham do. You know, I'm just like, <laughs> if you're qualified to learn the long pole uh, and um, and you, you're willing to pay for it, I'll teach it to you, right? Same with bacham do, right? Uh, you don't have to be an instructor. Um, however, students who start teaching or start assisting Especially like here, the way we do it, they start by assisting brand new beginners and then they slowly start, you know, ramping it up, teaching slightly more advanced students, in, in students, intermediate students. I can tell the difference between our students who help teach juniors and the ones who don't, even when they're at the same level or same rank in Wing Chun. Because the instructor or the junior instructor who has to explain to a beginner how to step how to close the gap, how to hold their fist, how to properly punch, how to turn. They have, they have to say these things. They have to remind themselves of the stuff they've learned and they have to demonstrate it in front of someone convincingly. So there's like this leveling up of all my students who also teach compared to the ones who don't. I can just tell like there's just a slightly deeper understanding and those who've explained bong sao for the upteenth time <laughs> to when they're actually doing it in training versus the ones who just come and show up and practice. Yeah. There's a, there's a huge difference. So the idea of having a small group uh, to supplement whatever online training uh, you're doing, I think is actually a really great idea. So those would be my recommendations. Of course, not all online programs are the same. Uh, there are some uh, Sifus that already have pre-canned uh, programs, like you can download a course or whatever. And there are others who teach live online, like one-on-one. -on -one. I'm more of a live online guy, but I have a couple courses for like Sunum Tao Chumkyu, Byuji, and Wooden Dummy. You can get those at cdwt.com on our shop. Mm -hmm. um, each of them, they're, it's, it, they're not full courses. They're like hour-long tutorials on each of the forms. Yeah. But if you wanted to learn those forms in detail, I literally have those on my online shop. You can go and uh, um, purchase them and you log in and then you have access to all the courses that or all the classes that you purchased. I even have a, like a kicking course on there and a few other things. So um, yeah, uh, those are my recommendations. So do you have anything I was going to say, well, I'd say my favorite course is the uh, clockwise rotation. <laughs> so that's a bit of an insight. That's very meta, bro. Uh, that's, a, um, uh, that's a total insider joke. So at City Wing Chun, uh, I really like for the students to regularly switch partners, okay? For beginners, it's a little bit different. So it's funny. The one group that sometimes I don't have switch are like the brand new beginners who need to kind of just learn some basics. And then the most senior who are learning something advanced that maybe like the other students don't know. But in general, the majority of the student body here, when we're doing different drills or when we're doing sparring, I want everyone to constantly have different training partners within the school because I don't want people to go like, oh, I like training with this guy because I got a good flow with this guy. Yeah, but you also need to train with the guy or gal that you don't have a good flow with because they're the ones that challenge you to be able to figure out how to make what you're doing work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not just the ones that are easygoing and uh, that you should be training with. It's the, you know, you want to train with a taller, shorter, stronger, the student with more experience, the student with less experience. The awkward student can also teach you a lot about how to apply your techniques. Not just the one that's good enough to practice with you. Train with an awkward student who has like weird janky body mechanics. And then show me how well you do your Wing Chun against the person who's kind of off. Then I'm impressed. Not the one person in the class that I know you like to work with, right? <laughs> so what we've done is we, I've institutionalized line switching. And if you've ever tried to like corral children to do things, you can s somewhat understand the difficulty, but it's not much better with adults. So we have a very basic line rotation at City Wing Chun. So you're, you basically, it's two lines facing each other, okay? You're facing your partner and you're doing, whether it's a cheese out drill or, a, or you're sparring, the one guy's non-Wing Chun, you're Wing Chun, whatever. 
two lines facing each other, spread out al along the hall. And then after about a minute or two, depending on what drill we're doing, sometimes it's longer, sometimes it's shorter, usually sparring drills, I do very quick rotations because I don't want you to get too comfortable with any one partner or to kind of get their feeling or their timing. So I'll say rotate. And when we rotate at City Wing Chun, we rotate one pace clockwise, okay? So if you imagine two lines facing each other, four on that side, four on this side. When I say rotate, everyone just moves one pace clockwise. And if you're at the end of the line, you move to the other side of the line clockwise. And if you're on this side of the line, you move to that side of the line clockwise. Very, very basic. Oh, but Sivu, what if you're odd numbered, all right? Well, then the odd man out, I'll usually give a different exercise. The odd man out might be on the dummy or the odd man out might be doing steps and punches or hitting the wall back, right? So when you're the odd man out, you rotate out clockwise, you're the odd man out, and then the next one, you're back in the rotation. A very, very simple method of rotating a group of adults. In theory. <laughs> <laughs> now, most of the students here in New York, yeah, it's right, you laugh because you know it's, it's the most simple thing in the world. But whenever we have classes going on, I go, rotate, there's always one person who goes the other way, who crosses to the other side, who uh, thinks that their partner is the next one. Like, so the problem with the line rotation, okay, so let's say you have four, you know, four people on that side, four people on this side, you're facing this guy. When I say rotate, some people think that that person to their, their partner's right is gonna be their next partner, but it's not. Because they're rotating one pace that way, you rotate one pace that way, so you effectively work with every other person, not the next person, right? But people always look at the next person next to their partner and then line up with them and then screw up the whole line. And I make, and when it doesn't work, when adults, screw up the most, to quote Sifu Lengting, basical of line rotations, I jokingly go on the whiteboard and say, all right, everyone, I'm gonna give you a free seminar on line rotation. And I do the four people, four people, this guy goes here, this guy goes here, this guy goes here. Well, but what if you're odd man out? Well, then you go to that odd out place and then you come back in line and then, then it goes like this and it goes around. And we, I jokingly have to do this thing every two weeks. Because uh, usually it's not for our New York students. It's sometimes our visitors, but it's sometimes our New York students. And it's almost <laughs> always the students from Connecticut. And, uh, and, and, you know, if we have visitors from out of the country, of course, they're not used to it at all. But most of them pick it up very quickly. And I always find it kind of embarrassing when we have a visitor to our school who picks up the line rotation better than some of our students who are here all the time. Right? <laughs> like, guys, this is really basic. I've actually, you know, we're going to do some renovations here to City Wing Chun. Um, we're gonna turn it from looking like an old dusty Mogun in Kowloon to a kind of more modern and hip martial arts school. So we're gonna take all the calligraphies and all this stuff off the walls, paint it, and we're gonna brand stuff with our logo. And, you know, I maybe might put some like inspirational quotes on the wall. And I have toyed with the idea of painting on the wall the line rotation scheme. So we have that wall there, right? You know, maybe we paint that wall gray or something like that, right? And then we have four white dots, four facing four white dots, an odd man dot, and we put the arrows. And <laughs> this is how we rotate at City Wing Chun, right? <laughs> it may be necessary because then if someone messes up, I go, eh? And I just point to the wall. Just like, you know, we have the rules, uh, the rules here, when someone messes up, we go, eh? Number eight. Eh? Number three then I'm not scolding them. The sign that's always been on the wall is, all right? So anyway, uh, thanks for bringing that up, hey, all right? You're welcome, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> I had so much more, but like, not to do with the line rotation, but actually it's kind of like really not, it's like kind of tangential to the actual question. I love that word, tangential. Yeah, I know. Yes. I, I, I also like uh, buttress. Buttress yes. is a great word. Yes, yes, you use that word when you built the... Uh, uh, when we put the lockers up there and you needed to buttress them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. One That's side. why I love doing the podcast with you. I feel that my vocabulary improves in, in a way that it, uh, that it just gets worse when I do episodes with Dre. <laughs> Every I'm time I do you. an episode with Dre, I feel that I'm forgetting words. Yeah, I'm here for you. I have a general rule of thumb that I like to surround mm. myself with people that um, 
have a have a, like a vast vocabulary, but nevertheless say f all the time. Yes, yes. They are very trustworthy people. Generally. Yeah, you know what? I uh, people who never curse at all. Now I'm not advocating, you know, being like a a foul mouth Susan everywhere you go. Right? Mm -hmm. There's a time and place, but people who never let an expletive out. Even when you're in private and no one is around, I'm very distrustful of people like that. Mm -hmm. Not even a shit. You yeah. know what I mean? I'm like, I just feel like they must be uh, kind of repressed or something. Like, it's like, yeah, every once in a while, you gotta let. There's no other word that can describe certain situations and certain S words and certain F words. Like, that is the exact thing you need to say. Mm -hmm. And people who never say those things, I'm always a little distrustful. Which is fair, mm. very fair. So if you're not local to NYC, one of the easiest ways for you to improve your Wing Chun training is to train online with me. Online private training is tailored toward the individual and geared towards serious practitioners who want to improve their skills or knowledge base. I offer two private lesson subscriptions, twice a month and four times a month. Kung Fu Genius listeners use the code KFG online to get one online consultation lesson free with the purchase of any subscription. That code and the links are in the description below. Online private training is a convenient way for you to ask any of the questions you've had about application, form, theory, or even how to teach. Bring a partner to train with you online at absolutely no extra cost. I'll show you how to train with your partner online. Again, use the code KFG online to get a free consultation lesson with the purchase of any online subscription. Links are in the description below, and I'll see you online. All right, so... Um, what else you got? Let's go on to the next question. Fantastical. Matthew Wiles. Hey, KFG, love the show. Let's talk footwear. Mm. Well, I'm already interested. I have a lovely pair of pumps. pumps. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. I knew, you know, we're, we're at that point now, we're like an old couple where we complete our sentences. All right? But I have a bit pumps, yeah. yeah you, complete, you complete me. I'm, you're the one half, I'm the other half, yeah, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. We, yeah. Um, we're not the same size, so they're mine. Just to be clear, he's, he's more of a, a Crocs kind of guy. But anyway... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> to be fair, those are actually fake Crocs that I have. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, they're gated. Uh, there's some brand, but they're not real Crocs. But they look like Crocs, but they're not real ones. So, so just... they're basically a Croc. <laughs> All right, let's get going here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, KFG, love the show. Let's talk footwear. What kinds of shoes do you favor or recommend to your students for uh, WC slash WT? I know you want a podiatrist. Um, but I play he, one, he plays on, one on TV. TV. <laughs> <laughs> See? Jesus Christ. <laughs> We're like an old married couple, oh but I God. play one on yes. TV. <laughs> but I'm always interested in what kinds of shoes other people train in. This interest goes back to the first time I did a kata in shoes and on grass. The feel was very different from training barefoot on a smooth wooden floor. I was, wasn't ready for that and tweaked my knee a bit. It made me conscious of clothing as a factor into how we are programming our bodies to move in martial arts. Mm -hmm. Personally, I tend towards more minimalist shoes for training and everyday wear. This is for comfort and for good ground feel, which I think is lost with big bulky sneakers, I agree. Mm -hmm. Kung Fu slippers obviously aren't practical streetwear. Fayus seem to wear out fast. Those are those ones that everyone those likes to wear. Those rubber ones, yeah. Yeah, the ones that yeah, get out actually, in China too. It's actually Fayu. Fayu. Yeah, but everyone says Fayus, but they're Fayu. Well, maybe they should yeah. put an accent on the E or something. No, maybe people should just learn how to read pinyin before they try to pronounce stuff. Oh, really? Yeah, that's me defending China there, by the way. That's yes. rare. Yes, that is right. very rare. Yeah. So it's just, I'm, he loves China. China's the we best. all love China. We all love Thank China. You, China. Thank you, China. Thank you for everything. For everything. You do everything perfectly. Perfectly. Thank you, China. Thank you, China. Okay. Yes. Anyway, that's. Uh, I do wear. I do wear Vibram Five Fingers for WT sometimes. Mm. The toes are more exposed, but the ground feel for stance grounding and shifting is excellent. However, Master Wong wear those, wears those too, oh and I don't know how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, as a general rule, whatever <laughs> Master Wong does or endorses, just do the opposite. Mm hmm absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Anyway, with all the usual caveats applied, I know that you aren't a podiatrist or a kinesiologist. He plays those one on a radio. What do you personally prefer and what do you recommend for students in your school? Well, I've always said I have a face for radio and a voice for television. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> 
Uh, All right, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so in WT, um, especially if you're on the Hong Kong side of things, uh, we wear uh, basically traditional Chinese slippers, which actually have, uh, instead of the those those weird cotton soles that you get in the Chinatown cheapies, it actually has a suede sole. Uh, but it's a, not cow, it's pig suede, by the way, in case anyone cares. Um, <laughs> and uh, the advantage of that is when you learn your stance turning and your advancing step, there's not a lot of friction and rub, so you can actually learn to do the footwork correctly, right? Uh, like if you were to wear big clunky Nikes to do the footwork, your heel would constantly snap up all the time because the rubber soles just have too much grip and you wouldn't be able to slide and the turn would be kind of funky and it would actually add a lot of extra pressure on your knees. Right. Um, so, uh, so the Wing Chun shoes, the soft soled slippers, actually achieve two aims. For the beginner, and even for the advanced practitioner, it allows you to do the footwork, I would say, in best case scenario conditions for Wing Chun footwork. You can really keep your feet flat as you turn, you can slide, and you don't have all this like extra friction. On the other hand, when someone attacks you and you're doing sparring and you give them a kick, you know, especially you still have to use controlled force if you're kicking to the leg, but um, those shoes are not going to like bruise up your partner's leg, right? I mean, try try using a pair of Air Jordans and then practicing stop kicks lightly on your partner's leg and you'll start to go, yeah, this doesn't really feel that great. <laughs> so the, um, the soft-soled slippers, while they may seem like we are all partying like it's 1799 when we wear those, um, they do have the added benefit of allowing the student to learn the footwork without any impediments like traction like too much traction and also to be able to spar with controlled force without kind of banging up your partner's leg or when you step on their foot you're not clonking on their foot with a big old pair of filas or something like that so uh that is a tremendous benefit however as was noted in the question you are not going to be wearing suede bottom slippers when you're walking down sixth avenue right and uh that is where sometimes people go, whoa, then shouldn't you train with sneakers? Um, well, yes, maybe on your own. Uh, if you are at home and you have a garage or you have a basement or somewhere where you have a normal pavement, I would highly recommend doing your Wing Chun in different types of footwear to feel what it's like. So uh, even if you're wearing the Vibram Five Fingers, they usually have a pretty rubbery sole. So uh, that's gonna give you a different feel than doing it in like a pair of rod lavers from Adidas, which have a very flat sole. Um, my, my favorite non-WT shoes to do Wing Chun in are uh, a, like low top Adidas with flat soles. Shell toes, rod lavers, um, all those kind of like, you know, like tennis shoes. Yeah, yeah They're Stan actually, Smiths. Yeah, Stan Smiths. Like those are actually good substitutes uh, for those are good sneakers for doing Wing Chun because they they split the difference a little bit they're flat so you have good ground connection the soles are not so clunky and rubbery that you can't really slide and move forward and um, you know if you did have to do do some light sparring with a partner they're not the worst shoes to get kicked lightly with of course I mean if you're gonna do heavy sparring you should be doing it if it's not in the Wing Chun shoes you should be doing it barefoot right because otherwise you, you just you know, beating the crap out of your partner with a big old pair of high top sneakers, right? Uh, so, so that's why I would say, like, if you're not going to do it with the soft soled Wing Chun slippers, so to speak, then you do it in some like low top, you know, Stan Smiths or something like that, right? But then the the other problem is then the flooring. So one of the issues with the soft soled shoes is that if you're on a hardwood floor, they can get really slippery. But if you're on a hardwood floor that has just been uh, coated, all right, uh, so it has like a fresh coat of polyurethane, it's perfect. But we struggled with this for years at City Wing Chun because before we got the mats, we used to have hardwood floors and we would only pull out the mats when it came time to like chuck someone on the ground, right? And the problem we had is like we would have a hardwood floor and then it, it, we'd put the coat of polyurethane on there, the clear coat, and then you'd be on there with the Wing Chun shoes and it was perfect. Uh, it wasn't slippery. Uh, you could drag your foot, you could turn, but you weren't slipping and sliding all over the place. 
But after three months of Wing Chun footwork on that, you wore off the polyurethane coat. And now you had a slick, ice-like surface. And the problem was this was dangerous not only, well, one could argue that, okay, if you're on a kind of somewhat slippery surface, it forces you to really be mindful of your uh, balance and how you're moving and you have to really like, so there could be like, it's almost like training, like running with a weight vest on, you now have a disadvantage by yeah. having somewhat slippery bottom. But the problem wasn't actually for the Wing Chun person. The problem was for when you were the attacker. Right. Because if you're the attacker, because in Wing Chun, as we've discussed before, I'm not a big fan of two Wing Chun people sparring against each other like as if you're going to get attacked by a Wing Chun guy on the street. When we do sparring here at City Wing Chun, if you were to come in on any sparring day, you would see, you know, one half of the group with their hands up in Zhong Zhao, like in a very active, pre-ready, pre-fight position. And the other side, they're standing like this in the position of someone who would attack you, not someone like this, right? So when you're the non-Wing Chun guy, you might have to throw a high kick. You might have to like, you know, do something weird like a spinning kick or some low kick or something like that. And then when you have the slippers on and you're on a slippery floor, you could end up falling down doing dumbass non-Wing Chun stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So that was always the problem. We would, we would put the polyurethane coat on the floor and three months later, it would be worn off by the very Wing Chun footwork that it's supposed to help. Yes. So I eventually said, screw it, and I got puzzle mats, all right? So like the one inch thick mats, and they are, in my opinion, the best. Because when you're on this floor with the Wing Chun shoes, you can slide and drag, but you do not slip. And when you're the bad guy, you can even have the Wing Chun slippers on and throw a high kick and you're, the floor is not gonna go out from under you. So I actually found that if you're going to use the soft-soled Wing Chun slippers, uh, while traditionally we think of doing Wing Chun on a hardwood floor, my recommendation would be to get puzzle mats. You can get them, if you're here in America, the best place to get puzzle mats is greatmats.com. Uh, that's where we get all of ours. Run by a guy named Matt, who's great. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's not called it's not called Great Mats because they sell mats. It's because uh, it's a bunch of brothers named Matt. Yeah. All right. Uh, so uh, and they're great. <laughs> uh, so yeah, GreatMats.com because they, they can you can buy them in bulk there and send them over. So for WT people who use the soft sole uh, shoes, get off the hardwood floors. All right, it's dangerous. All right. Yeah. Use puzzle mats. They're the best. Okay. If you are a WT person that uses hardwood floors, maybe you rent at a ballet studio or a dance studio, uh, then if there is enough clear coat on there, you can still use the Wing Chun shoes. Right. But if it's worn off, I would recommend low top Adidas, shell top, Stan Smith, Rod Labors, those kind of shoes, all right? That's my recommendation for WT because then you can you can do the footwork and keep the feet flat and turn and and drag and do all that kind of stuff, right? And then when you're the bad guy, you don't need to worry about the floor slipping out from under you, right? So that's what I would say to do WT correctly because those shoes allow you to turn properly. Right. But now we go into a separate topic. So we have to this is a topic that needs to be compartmentalized. So ideal for WT, soft sole shoes on a puzzle mat. This I found, this is the best combination. Second, low tops, flat, flat shoes on a hardwood floor. Okay, that's ideal for WT training, we put that aside. But what about the very realistic situation of having to defend yourself not in either of those shoe types and not on either of those types of floors? Okay, that is then where you then also need to train on other types of flooring with other types of shoes. So. What happens is sometimes you go, well, I'm not gonna fight and slide and drag my foot. Yeah, but first of all, that's the, the proper way to do the Wing Chun footwork with your foot flat as you slide forward is the tendency you want so you can always kick with your front leg. If you start wearing clunky ass Nikes, you have to start making compensations for the lack of drag and then your weight distribution is wrong and you don't have that kick when you need it. Right. So if you're used to having the correct footwork because you wear the right shoes, your tendency, even when you have clunkers on, is to still stand in a better posture and better position because you haven't constantly trained in these adaptations for the sake of the footwear uh, wear that you have on. Right. So that's why, yeah, you wanna know what it's like to do Wing Chun in other footwear? Do it, all right? One time a week, 
Put on your clunky ass Nikes and go in your garage. All right. Put on your um, I don't know what are the kids wearing Yeezys. All right. <laughs> and uh, and 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 train on gravel. All right. Especially on gravel. Screw those Yeezys up. Those yeah, Yeezys are ugly. Yeah. Now. Not sure if people are wearing Yeezys these days. But after. Uh, I mean, you know, that, 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 it's amazing how that, that new cycle just kind of gradually it died away. Died yes, away, yes, yes. You know I, mean? I, I, I knew that that dude had shoes called Yeezys, but I didn't know what they looked like until I saw them in the store. Uh, all of his high fashion stuff is awful. But like, I don't, I don't, I don't, like, I get sneakerheads. We got Kess, our boy who did mm-hmm. the Kung Fu Genius rap song. Kess is a big sneakerhead. Yeah. And Kess will show me, like, all these different Jordan variations. And, and I'll look at that and I'll go, those are nice sneakers. Mm hmm. And then I look at the Yeezys and I go, what are you paying me to wear those things? Mm -hmm. I'm not buying those things. You need to pay me a few hundred dollars to put those things on my feet. I tell you the ones that I actually, they're not Yeezys, the uh, sneakers I actually really wanted. Um, And I saw someone actually get a pair of them in real time for their birthday. Mm -hmm. Right Back when I was working at the club, we did uh, Wendy Williams' son's 13 year, 13 years old birthday right wow that's a rare reference i know wendy right? williams 13 year old son's birthday yeah was great. she there oh yeah yeah she was there uh-huh. with her husband and did she say how you doing did she do that thing there <laughs> not to me unfortunately oh, i would okay. have loved that it would have been great but uh you know they got meek mill to perform live wow which was amazing yes um but that's not a thing. That he got a pair of the Back to the Future sneakers, the ones, the actual the self lacing ones, the self lacing ones. Oh wow! Like, like lit up and everything. It was like, like and I and and it, yeah, they they were dope. Yes, I, yes, they yes. Were, I was like, you know, I much want unlike Yeezys. Yes, All very right? much like yes. completely the opposite right. to Yeezys. Yes. So my recommendation for WT is tr- do it in one of the optimized types of footwear on one of those optimized floors, but then once a week. Do your, do your footwork, do uh, steps training, heavy bag training or whatever in your garage on gravel and, and, and feel the adaptation. The problem is that um, the more uh, grip you have on the shoes, the more torque that's going to be on your joints when you're turning. And then people might say, well, then isn't that a problem with the way we do Wing Chun or something like that? No. The problem is if you fight, okay? and someone fires a punch at you and you're wearing your clunky ass Yeezys and you're on 6th Avenue or whatever, you turn once to move out of the way and you take one or two steps to go in and punch the guy. But in a training session, you might have to turn 40, 50, 100 times in one session because you're, you're doing it for training. You might have to step up and down the floor hundreds of times because it's training. And so that you don't necessarily want to do on something where you have all this extra load on your knees and, and there's all this extra kind of weird way of moving because of the way the, the footwear is impeding you. But as Siva Lang Ting would always say, yeah, in the class, maybe we do the steps up and down, up and down, up and down a bunch of times for the beginners. But he goes, but in the fight in the street, you take one or two steps. The guy comes out, bam, 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 and you're in there and you're clinching and you're holding the guy and the guy's trying to grab you and his elbow, but you're not stepping all the way across Sixth Avenue. So the problem is there's also a, a, a kind of a, a distortion of outcomes because uh, the requirements for training, which is massive amounts of reps to get good at a skill versus what you would need in self-defense which is just you, you take a couple steps as you close the gap and the, there the fight is on already. You're not advancing. You're not doing a rear weighted advancing step from 39th Street to Central Park yeah. in your Yeezys. All right. Mm-hmm. So I think people then sometimes distort that or they get a little hysterical about not training in the right shoes because of what the fight is going to be like. Right. So my recommendation is then experiment different shoes, different types of flooring, different types of ground, different types of traction. But don't get so crazy about that, that you're worried about what's going to happen in a fight where you're going to take one or two steps. And the fight never looks like you're training anyway. All right. right? The guy's in your face. Your hands are up like this. You're like, hey, buddy, take it easy. Like the guy's getting too close to you and you're already here. And the guy makes a move and bam, bam, bam. You're you're not stepping and doing chum cue 10 times while you're in the middle of the fight. So I think sometimes people confuse the training methods the repetition 
the what's required in practice versus what you're going to do in fighting, which is a very short, clipped, and abridged version of all of the above. Yeah. So um, I'm not a big fan of the Feiyue's because uh, they have their uh, the bottom of the Feiyue's are rubber. All right, so they're like total stick. Why are those shoes popular among martial artists in China? Because they're for wushu. Ah, okay? I see. And so when, you, when you're practicing wushu, which is, is an acrobatic form of Chinese martial arts, uh, if you watch those wushu performers from China, and our good friend Wu Woman is a wushu performer. She's amazing. She wears those types of shoes. She's actually just uh, texted me. She's going to be going to China. I think she might be there around the time we're in Hong Kong. Oh, wow. She's going to be competing. Oh, amazing. In wushu. She hasn't competed in a very long time. Yeah. Um, but those rubber sole shoes, if you watch the wushu competitors, they'll be in those really low stances. And often you need that traction to hold that stance because you're like in a really low horse stance. And then you might, for example, jump to do some kind of like 720 kick. Well, you can't be doing that with shoes that are slippery and you can't be doing that in heavy, clunky shoes. You need right. a solid rubber sole that gives you the grip in order to do that. So the requirements for wushu, wu, Chinese wushu is not a traditional martial art. Wushu is a performance art. Right. And so the requirements of the performance art gave way to shoes like Fei Yue's. And now, of course, they're like, and now they're like a trendy brand. They used to just, <laughs> like, I remember uh, you used to have to go down to Chinatown to get Fei Yue's. And now they have Fei Yue's at like normal shoe stores. Yeah. So, like, whoever in China is cranking those things out is making a nice buck. They even did a, um, a cooperation between Fei Yue and the official Bruce Lee uh, store. Oh, wow. So they have like Bruce Lee Fei Yue's. Uh, <clears throat> sorry. Just, something in my throat. Uh -huh. So, um, Bruce Lee would be rolling in his grave if he knew his daughter is selling his image to some mainland Chinese company for wushu shoes. <laughs> like, like, like I, I think Bruce Lee would have a conniption fit if he yeah. knew that, right? Of course. Um, but, you know, yay branding, yay Bruce Lee bobbleheads. We love Shannon Lee. She does everything correctly in marketing her father. Okay, so uh, those are my thoughts on footwear. Now, there's one last part of that, which is something that I'm becoming more and more partial to in recent years. And that's if you have mats, puzzle mats, you can also train Wing Chun barefoot. Now, of course, when you're doing a lot of advancing steps, it can sometimes wear a little bit. So you have to, you have to build a little bit of toughness into your feet um, for karate practitioners or Thai boxers who always train barefoot or jujitsu people. It's um, not that big of a deal because the feet are used to it. Um, but uh, for some Wing Chun people, they might not be used to it, but barefoot training, um, especially on a matted floor, is also really good for Wing Chun. And for sparring, when we do the sparring here at City Wing Chun with the gear, uh, we have the students either on these matted floors wear uh, the Wing Chun shoes or go barefoot. But yeah. there's, no, there's no option C. Mm -hmm. There's no, you can wear your Fei Yue's uh, or you can wear your Nikes under your shin pads or something yeah. like that, right? <laughs> so uh, barefoot training also works. And I, I wasn't a huge fan of it at first, but actually I, I really like training uh, Wing Chun barefoot these days. So I will, uh, when, even when I teach, some classes I'll teach with the Wing Chun shoes, some classes I'll teach barefoot. And I like doing the knife form barefoot because I, uh, just because of the type of footwork and you're really moving and everything like that. So, so I really prefer it. So that is the, the other option for me. The funny thing is I can do Wing Chun footwork up and down the mats and I can do all this stuff till the cows come home and my feet are fine. But whenever I, um, in, in past years, when I would go to, uh, to Hong Kong uh, to do Wing Chun, I would also train at a Thai boxing gym. Uh, that was uh, very close, not too far from where we're staying in Hong Kong. Right. And I would just go there just for some good cardio and some practice. And it's, it's fun to train Thai boxing and, and not tell anyone like you're a Wing Chun guy, just show up and just kind of train, you know, and, and, and train with different guys who don't know who you are and don't care, which is mm -hmm. great. But every time after like my first Thai boxing class, like I just all the skin would be ripped off my toes. Right, because um, because you have to pivot on the ball of your foot. Yep. 
And that specific type of wear and tear on my foot is not something that my foot is accustomed to. So I would always have these big chunks of skin just rip off my big toe and then, and then have to walk the rest of the time like this and then have to wrap it for the next few classes. And, and so there, there, there could be some, uh, if, if your feet are not used to the sliding and moving, you might want to do barefoot training in Wing Chun like for short periods first as you get acclimated to it and then do it a little bit more. So right. um, we are done a little bit early, but mm -hmm. I feel like we could probably squeeze another question in there. Oh, we could absolutely squeeze another question in there. Funny enough, I was going to say I actually yes. really, really enjoyed training barefoot, but then I had a bit of a unlucky year with my feet where I just kept injuring them in the same spot. Yes. Like, and I'd like it heal, and then a week later, I'd do the same thing. Yes. And one of those ones was, um, I mean, I was probably, I was a gray shirt at this point, uh -huh. I'm pretty sure. Uh -huh. Oh, maybe I'd just gone so back. So for people who don't know what that is, like an intermediate chum Q level student. Yeah, I'm pretty sure either, either that or I'd just become a black shirt, right? Uh -huh. And I just remember a couple of times training with um, uh, Ethan, uh -huh. um, uh, not obviously Sifu Ethan, but- Yes, yes, and, um, student Ethan. Student Ethan. And, uh, doing uh, like a uh, pack punch, like stepping in, and I stepped incorrectly with an arrow step, and I just, yeah. a little toe. You're right. And I didn't break it, but I yeah. dislocated it somewhat. Yeah. Which is almost worse. Yeah, so and I'm just there, and I'm like, ah, yeah. like this. I literally had to pop it back in. Yeah, that is a, that is a liability with the barefoot inspiring. That's why um, I think the barefoot inspiring is better when you have, because we wear shin pads, yeah. and the shin pads have that instep which covers the foot, Mm -hmm. because we, we step on people's feet a lot in Wing Chun. Like, that's part of what we do. Yeah. Um, and so that can be a little... Yeah, you're right. I mean, that that is the one liability of that. That's why at least with the Wing Chun shoes, your 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 toes are protected, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's also the reason why the gloves that we use at City Wing Chun are mitten style. Because everyone wants to, like, feel like an MMA bro and come with those fingerless gloves. Yeah. And those fingerless gloves have two major issues, at least as far as Wing Chun training goes. And they're also actually the same two issues in MMA. And one is the accidental eye gouges. All right? Because when your, you know, hands are flying, things are coming at you, you're defending, there's things like packs up. There's open fingers going accidentally towards your partner and the... the the chance for an eye gouge is, an accidental eye gouge is very, very high. Yeah. And that happens in MMA all the time, right? And in fact, you know, they're, they're notorious cheats, like John Jones, who kind of, you know, <laughs> instigate eye gouges. And then, but I would say the fair amount of eye gouges that are done in UFC are totally accidental. Yeah. The thumb goes into the eye if the hand is a little too loose on the punch or something like that. And so I, um, I found the, and we make these mitten style gloves. And I actually got the idea because in very old videos of uh, Sifu Leung Tings, where they would show the sparring, like dynamic Wing Chun, they had like the helmet on, they had the chest protector on, and they wore mitten style gloves. The only problem was by the time I started learning Leung Teng Wing Chun, they didn't sell those things. In Europe, they sold fingerless gloves with these little pads on the, on the side. Right. And the chance to accidentally gouge someone's eyes or for fin an errant finger even to go in someone's mouth or something like that <laughs> was, was kind of high, right? And also jamming your fingers and things like that. So um, I actually found in Hong Kong some mitten style gloves and now our own manufacturer makes them and we also sell them on the online shop. So they're mitten style gloves, so you never have to worry about gouging your partner's eyes. You still have the opposable thumb, so you can pax out. And, and they're not gloves that are f uh, forced in like, you know, boxing glove is yeah. forced in this style here, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so then when you have boxing gloves on, it becomes increasingly more difficult to do some specific Wing Chun techniques. Um, but you can do like deflecting chain punches and things like that, right? Uh, but with our fingerless gloves, you can pack. And, with the, and you can lap and you can grab and you can do all your hand techniques and you never have to worry about gouging your partner's eyes out. And they have enough padding on there to be decent sparring gloves and they have enough padding to be good bag gloves. Mm -hmm. So I find that that's actually the, the best way. Those are the best type of gloves because you don't have the eye gouge. The other problem with the MMA bro fingerless gloves that everyone's so fond of is they have effing Velcro around them. Oh, yeah, I've got, just had that with just... Yeah. yeah, so, so you know, in Wing Chun, where we're using concepts like kun, siu kun, like fist to defend a fist, you're a, your partner fires a punch at you and use a deflecting punch to deflect that incoming punch with a bunch of 
Velcro and then you shred their arm. Like I can always like, it always bugs me because like, well at City Wing Chun, the students have to wear our equipment. But every once in a while, someone decides to go rogue and bring some like fingerless, you know, Velcro gloves. And then I see half the students in the line rotation have all these like scratches all over their forearms. And it's like, yeah, it's not your problem when you wear those Velcro fingerless gloves. It's everyone else's problem. <laughs> Absolutely. And of course, that whole Velcro thing is solved in UFC because they tape the gloves. Right. Right. So they, 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 you know, the UFC gloves also have the Velcro over the wrist. They're basically like wrist supports, but they put a big old chunk of tape to keep that Velcro from scratching anyone. Right. But if you're using them as regular everyday sparring gloves, you can't put a big old chunk of tape over them every time you use it. Yeah. So that's the reason why, like, I know some Wing Chun guys want to feel like MMA bros or whatever, but those are really not the gloves to wear for sparring because of the eye gouges, accidental or otherwise, and the, the whole Velcro issue there. So what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected Wing Chun masters in history? Gong Sao Wong, a tribute, directs students on Sifu Wong Sao Leung, offers you just that. Through a series of exclusive conversations, 25 direct students share anecdotes, reflections, and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man behind the legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love this book, and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend recommend it enough get yours today go to amazon type in gong sao wong and there you go okay so what else you got for me yeah what else do i have for you oh let's see um roberto santiago hi sifu alex please find the time to book ron van cleef on the podcast for an interview he is amazing and i'm dying to hear how wing chun fits into his lifelong training of multiple martial arts disciplines yeah uh ron van cleef's an old friend uh talked about getting him on I think now because uh, we have changed up the AMA format and we're going to do more topic episodes so I think more interviews are definitely coming up uh, we have some interviews that uh, some interesting things that I already have planned for the next few days before we go to Hong Kong uh, one of them includes a uh, Cantonese podcast not uh. in Cantonese but I'm going to be doing a um, an interview with a Cantonese teacher she's from Fatsan the kind of where Wing Chun comes from, where Yip Man comes from. And she teaches Cantonese online. And a lot of people have asked me like, oh, can you, uh, you know, teach us a little bit of Cantonese or whatever? I'm not the dude to teach Cantonese. So I have an actual Cantonese teacher I'm gonna have on the podcast. And I'm gonna have her teach our audience how to properly pronounce words that are Wing Chun related. So even like how to properly say Wing Chun and Fist and Pak Sao and the, the names of the forms and Yip Man and things like that. But then I also asked her like, let's also do some Bruce Lee terminology, like how to say Bruce's stage name and how to uh, uh, say his real name and how to properly pronounce Tik Kun Do and, and how to uh, say the names of Bruce Lee's films in Chinese. Yeah. And then also on top of that, I also sent her like a bunch of general Kung Fu words like Shaolin and kick and punch and things like that. So it'll be a good episode for people who want to kind of make their pronunciation of Cantonese terms a little bit more sturdy. So we're going to be doing that. And, you know, getting Ron Van Cleef on to do an episode is definitely the type of thing uh, that I would like to do because I really like conversations. I really like interviews because I don't have to talk that much. <laughs> I can actually learn something when someone else is in front of me. So getting um, getting Ron Van Cleef on is definitely probably something we can do. I don't know how much Wing Chun he's doing these days. He's really into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and I think his kind of like karate and Wing Chun days, I think those are long behind him. So I, I don't, you know... People, I think, sometimes read old interviews and have a perception that that's still kind of the same way. Ron is living in Hawaii. He's living his best life, doing jujitsu, hanging out at the beach. So I don't really know how much Wing Chun factors into it. I know he was on the cover of Wing Chun Illustrated recently, but, you know, that, that, that just still doesn't mean that, like, Wing Chun is top of mind for him. So Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right. Absolutely. What else you got? What do you got to close it out today? No. Um, Chris Beery. What dishes, food are you looking forward to eating the most in Hong Kong? Let me answer that first. I'm looking forward to eating a marmalade sandwich. Uh, yes. Um, well, you probably could get that. I mean, they, they have, 
You know, in the Peninsula Hotel, they have high the high tea or high noon tea or whatever they call it, something <laughs> like that, right? So we we should actually go there and like we can dress totally. Pr- you know what we should do? You and I should dress like. Um, Jeff Daniels and Jim Carrey from Dumb and Dumber and go into the Peninsula Hotel for high tea. <laughs> I got the tooth. I've got yes. Lloyd Christmas's tooth right that now. That would be perfect. All right, We just walk in there and just slap you with the cane. <laughs> like we walk in and make a big public testicle of ourselves. That would be amazing. Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, well, so uh, I am most looking forward to the food in Hong Kong. That's really what I miss the most. So obviously... You know, dim sum is a huge thing when you're over there. But like to be fair, we have you know I I've, I've been to Toronto twice this year, and the the dim the Chinese food in Toronto is on par with the food in Hong Kong. That's not a controversial statement because in '97, um, when Hong Kong was handed over to a country of unknown origins, um, a lot of the top chefs left Hong Kong and move to places like Vancouver and Toronto. So you actually have in those two cities some of the best cooks from Hong Kong and they'd open restaurants there and the quality of the Chinese food because it's such a huge Hong Kong Chinese community there is amazing. So it's it's not like I'm completely lacking like really authentic Hong Kong style dim sum, for example. And we also have in Flushing, we have lots of really great restaurants, although Flushing is not quite quite the level of uh, Toronto. Um, but what I like in Hong Kong, it's it's all the little things that you can't get over here. Like they have uh, cha chan tangs, which is basically a Chinese diner. Mm-hmm. And we have some cha chan tangs here, but really the Hong Kong style cha chan tang is really, really the way to go. It's, it's a, imagine a Chinese diner where all the dishes are like a, it's like, you know, how in America we have shitty ch- Americanized Chinese food. Yeah. Like chop suey and all that crap, mm-hmm. right? And that's like the American version of Chinese food. Yeah. Well, imagine the Chinese version of Western food. Ooh. Except, unlike the American version of Chinese food, it's actually good. Ooh. So when you go to a Chinese diner, they will have, like, kind of their version of, like, British or American continental-style breakfasts, but it's done with a Chinese spin. Yeah. And it's really good. So, uh, like, like I, I really like just going to those diners in Hong Kong, those Chinese-style diners, and getting breakfast. And even just going to places like Fairwoods, which are, it's a chain. Mm-hmm. It's a, for Hong Kong people, it's really nothing special. But like the, the food you can get there, it's like, it's like Chinese and Western in one meal. You can get like, um, you, for breakfast, you can get a soup with like um, abalone and macaroni and ham in it. And then like, you know, like a bun and eggs. Wow. Yeah. And it, it's, it's like so good. Oh, nice. And then they have the um, chong fun is the... Um, the rice noodles, like yeah. the flat ones. Mm-hmm. And you can go to these stands where you get the chang fun with three sauces on them. Wow. And they just give you, and it's like these little rice roll noodles mm-hmm. with three sauces, like a peanut sauce, a black sauce, and a red sauce, and some sesame seeds dumped on it. And they just give you like a poker, a wood poker. You just eat it, and it's so good. It's You can find it in Flushing, but there's only a couple places that have it, but you can get it anywhere in Hong Kong. Right. Uh, it's, it's, so it's not just like the big grandiose, like, like high level Cantonese cuisine restaurants, which are also awesome. The thing that I miss in Hong Kong when I'm not there is all the small stuff. It's a ta It's like the way they make the, uh, l- uh, cold lemon tea yeah. in Hong Kong style. The, you know, Dong Leng Cha, you know, Siu Ting, Siu Beng, all right. Little sweet, little ice. All right. The way they, it's so good. Uh, so I miss, and you will see that like all these like little things that they have they're almost like their versions of our stuff, mm-hmm. which is so good. Um, and you know, but all the food there, I mean, when even just even the non Chinese food in Hong Kong is really high level. Like the Japanese restaurants, the sushi restaurants, the Korean barbecue places in Hong Kong, it's just all good. It's just, yeah, yeah. So um, it's difficult to say what dishes because I I, I don't. I don't go to Hong Kong for specific dishes. I go for like the restaurants that you go there. There's a chain in Hong Kong for Hainanese chicken, which is basically steamed chicken, but they do Thai style te- steamed chicken. It's like Thai style Hainanese chicken, and it's a chain that just serves that. Ooh. And it's steamed chicken with like the chili sauce and a certain type of rice. And that's pretty much all they sell. And it's so good. 
And then there's uh, like when if you go to a place like Choi Wa, which actually a lot of them closed during COVID, which is another Cha Chan Tang in Hong Kong. I like Ju Pa Pao. Ju Pa Pao is literally just a pork sandwich. And again, it's a Chinese version of like a Western thing. Yeah. But it's so good. And then, uh, and, 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 and even just like the, um, I like the, the, they have the bun with mm-hmm. condensed milk on it. Oof. And it's like a toasted Western style bun with condensed sweet milk on it. And it's ridiculous. It's like way more calories than I would ever want to eat. But in, in Hong Kong, we're going to be walking so much. It doesn't matter. Yeah. The weird thing about Hong Kong is I eat like twice as much as what I normally eat here and I always lose weight because we're going to be walking and you're going to be sweating like Mikey Dean in a KFG podcast. Um, So like you're going to be eating all this food, but like between the Kung Fu training, all the hiking, the walking and the sheer amount of heat and sweat, you're probably going to lose weight despite the fact that you're going to feel like you're in a pig trough everywhere you go. Uh, It's really amazing. And that's all I got to say about that. We forgot to record an outro, so this is Bear Hoskins saying I hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you for watching, don't forget to like and subscribe, and if you have any topic ideas for future episodes, leave them in the comments below, and I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a kung fu genius Technique speaks for me, not lineage Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Seagung And I produce masters, you surpassed us Your kung fu stiffer than corpse and caskets City Wing Chung is the house I built Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt Alex Richter, always the victor There's a lot of dead air on this episode Yeah, I think just don't you don't have to edit it This is perfect Yeah, just, just leave it like this it's Maybe you can put in Jeopardy music No, no, don't do that, that'll like demonetize Monetize the episode. <laughs> okay, so maybe what we need Andrew to do is uh, just put a photo of Paddington Bear whenever you talk for the rest of this episode. Andrew, I think we're going to do that. All right. Yeah, so whenever it, he's speaking, just put uh, Paddington Bear or uh, Bob Hoskins or Bob Hoskins as Paddington Bear. Fantastic. So Take much really. more professional than Dre. <laughs> that Dre.